loves us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for us so we can have eternal life with you in heaven. We just thank you for all it is that you have done for us. And we, Lord, as we just come to you this morning, we just ask you that we would come to you with thankful and grateful hearts for what it is that you've done for us. And that we would just be willing just to give back the only acceptable sacrifice that we can offer to you in return. And that is our own lives. So, Lord, if there's one here this morning that has never made that commitment to give their life to you, we just pray that today would be the day of salvation for that one. And, Father, for the rest of us, we just pray that we would just, our faith would just be strengthened. Strengthened through the meeting of ourselves and settling ourselves together here with you so we can just hear your word proclaimed in power and might and truth. So we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you and serve this mighty God that we're singing about this morning. And we just thank you and praise you for all these things. We lift up the precious name of Jesus.
circumstances, likableness, people that are nice to us, people that love us, that loves without any reservations. And and it's that it's that love that spurs us, that that, that causes us to respond to God, to, to to want to do something for Him. And so when when it's when it's birthed in our heart to to, to carry the gospel to a, a far nation that, that's where it originates. It originates not with me, not with, with, with a kid, not with, with any person or a part of this church. It originated with, with Christ reaching out to us. And, and our only way of responding to that is to, to demonstrate that love in some tangible way to the world. And so as we have been preparing for this, this mission, that's, that is it's the heart of it. It, it, it is the love that God has demonstrated to us that we are compelled to take to the rest of the world. It's, it's what defines us as Christians. They will know you are my disciples, the, the love that you have for one another. And so we have been preparing for this. We've gone through Colossians and in, in preparation. This is the sixth week, the sixth message. We, we learned that it originated, this message, message or mission originates in new life. As we become a follower of Christ, we have new life, and that new life prompts us to do something for God, to carry the gospel to the, to the ends of the earth. And, and, and then we, we talked about the only essential, the only thing that is absolutely 
not compromisable in, in our mission suitcase, and that is Christ. It's the one thing we can't leave out. It's the one thing that has to be packed. And then we talked about wet luggage. And that is the, the, the impact that difficulties and challenges have on our mission. And that it only causes us to be more resolved and, and more determined to do what God has called us to do. And we looked at carry-on luggage. Those things that we tend to take on the trip that have no business in the suitcase. Our traditions, our rules, our regulations that we want to impose on other people and they have nothing to do with the mission. And then, and then last week, we talked about ugly luggage. The fact that we need to look completely different than the world. That we should be so markedly different, we should stand out in the crowd, and, and, and in that we draw people to Christ. And today we're going to look at unpacking the suitcase. Once we have arrived on our mission field, which applies to every one of you, it's going to, to apply to 27 of us in that we're going to arrive on the mission field in, in Lima, Peru, and begin unpacking everything it is that God has given us to deliver. But for the rest of you, it might be in your own home, it might be in your workplace, on your ball team, whatever it might be, wherever God has placed you, it is your mission field. It is where you will deliver the goods that God has given you. We're going to look at that today. We're going to look at six essentials in the suitcase. Six practical components that will bring success to your mission. When I say success, it might not even mean, it might not even turn out to be someone being saved. Success is when you do what God has called you to do. Now, praise the Lord if that results in success and that someone comes to know Christ. But know this, that that's not your responsibility. And we're going to look at what our responsibilities are as we hit the mission field today. As we begin looking at Colossians chapter 4. Before we open to God's word this morning, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you that you are giving us this incredible opportunity to take the gospel to, to the nation of Peru. We thank you, God, that it is our privilege, it is our responsibility, that, Lord, you have provided everything that we've needed. We praise you for that. We thank you for your saints, Lord, that have helped accomplish that. And now, Lord, as we today, as we today in our last uh, worship time together prepare for that, I pray, God, you just bless us that we can hear from your word. And, Lord, we can be energized, we can be changed, we can be equipped in every way possible by an encounter with your word. We look forward to that. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn in, in, in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. And we're going to begin at, at verse 2 this morning. Reading through verse uh, 6. And it says this, Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Man, I'm telling you, in those five verses, there is packed so much truth to the Christian who desires to share the gospel with the world. That you want, you have a passion, you have a desire to, to complete the mission that God has given you. There are five verses here that just are jammed with, with truth in regard to that. And we're going to look at that. We're going to unpack that here today. And it begins with this. A successful mission will be accomplished first through prayer. Through prayer. He says in the beginning there, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote, man, that means, that means committed. That means this isn't just something I'm going to tack on at the end of the day. Something I'm going to throw in before I eat my happy meal. I am going to be committed to this. Prayer is going to be an integral part of every moment of my life. And, and He's preparing them for the mission. And He's preparing them for His mission. Devote yourselves to prayer. You know, there's, there's a, a, a big question that jumps at me when I read this. And it's this. 
Does prayer make a difference? Does prayer change circumstances? Because we might say, yeah, we believe that. But, but frankly, we don't live that way. And, and, and honestly, I hear a lot of preachers today who, who even go as far as to say, well, prayer changes me more than it changes circumstances. And I'm not saying that prayer doesn't change us when we are committed to praying. But we have to believe that prayer truly does change circumstances. The Scripture is filled with it. There's the encounter where Jesus is, it, it, the, where the disciples can't cast out the demon. And they say, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus said, things like this only happen with prayer and fasting. I mean, there is tangible differences made through prayer. Life changes. Circumstances change as a result a prayer. There's a quote on your paper from David Brainerd who was a missionary. And he said this, the idea that everything would happen is exactly as it does regardless of whether we pray or not is a specter that haunts the minds of many who sincerely profess belief in God. It makes prayer psychologically impossible replacing it with dead ritual at best. If we do not believe that prayer changes anything then why would we be compelled to do it? In fact, he says it just becomes a dead ritual. We're not really even praying. We're just reciting some words. We have to believe that prayer truly does change circumstances. And his prayer here is first for ourselves. He says, pray for yourselves. But then he says, and pray for us too. So the prayer is not only geared for you, it's geared for others. As we prepare for the mission field, Paul was preparing for the mission field. He was on the mission field when he wrote this letter. Actually, he was in, in prison, which was his mission field. But he was saying, pray for us. Pray for yourself, but pray for us too. And then he, he, he delineated, he, he wrote out specifically what the prayer request was that he wanted. You know, there's 27 of us who should be diligently praying for our upcoming mission. And there's about a hundred of you that should be diligently praying for our upcoming mission. Every one of us should be committed to prayer in regards to the mission that we have before us. The prayer will make a difference. The prayer is a critical component of this. It's, it's absolutely necessary. And to enter the, the mission field before or without that is a, is a hazard. You know, there's, there's a, a in, in military operations. And, it, and we saw this with the, the Iraq war. As they were ready to make this assault on Baghdad, the first thing that they did was they went in with, with these bombers and they just absolutely just hammered the city over and over again. They just bombed them over and over again. Why? They were, they were softening it up so that when the ground troops came in, they could move in effortlessly. Prayer is that preemptive bombing attack. It is what prepares the territory that you hope to invade. You got somebody in your life who is living apart from Christ, who doesn't know God, pray for them. You are, you are preparing the territory. You are preparing the land so that when you walk in, they are receptive and ready to hear the Word of God. If you want to see a great work in Peru, if you want to see a great work in, in the life that the, the people that you're ministering to, you need to commit to prayer. Make prayer an a, a, a integral part of it. And he says, prayer and fasting. I encourage you this week. In the next, in the next three days as we prepare, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, as we prepare to leave from this mission trip, that you, you commit to prayer and even commit to, to fasting for a period of time in anticipation for the work that God has for us in Peru. And as we continue in in, in this, in verse 3, he says, And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. And we'll just stop there. Pray for us too, that God will open up a door for our message. The next successful mission component is, a successful mission will be accomplished through an opportunity. We have to remind ourselves that opportunity comes from God. Opportunity is not created by me. It comes from God. He says, 
open the door. It's implied in there that we don't have the opportunity to create the opportunity. It is not our job. It's not our responsibility to create the opportunity that comes from God. Pray that God opens a door. That's an opportunity. It's, it's going to be that chance that we have to present the gospel, to have an impact on somebody's life. And so he says, pray for that opportunity. Pray that that door will be open so that I can step in and do what, what I've been called to do. You know, Tracy spoke a couple of weeks ago of a, a divine appointment. And it is, he, he had this woman that he just happened to bump into at, at the minute board in North Arizona. Led to a, a couple hours meeting, praying together, where she, she received Christ as her Savior. And we can look at that and say, what a, what a chance, what an incredible chance that that happened. But it was that opportunity. He didn't go looking for it, really. He went to pick up some ice cream. But God had a different plan. And there was an open door that he was ready to step into. And we need to look for those open doors, but we can't create them. Too many times we, as Christians, we, we look for, we look at someone in our life that's important to us. We, we think, man, I'd like them to know Christ. And, and so what we do is we attempt to create an opportunity. We attempt to kick the door in. And all that leads to is frustration. Why? Because we have, we have left God out of the equation. We haven't trusted God to make that opportunity, to create that situation where the time is right. It, it's a perfect time in order for us to present the gospel. And so we need to live with an awareness. Uh, 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 we're always looking. We're always on edge in regards to seeing the opportunity that God prevent, presents to us to present the gospel. And when we create an opportunity or attempt to, it leads to frustration. And one of the most difficult things about this is patience. If there's somebody in your life that you passionately care about and that you so much want to see them come to know Jesus, you want so bad for them to experience the new life of, of the counsel of a relationship with Christ. You want that so bad and, and yet... You can't create the opportunity. You have to wait on That requires patience. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until God makes it clear, until He opens that door, and then I'm going to step in there. That requires patience. Opportunity comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It's not created. It's not forced. It comes from God. And what do we do with that opportunity? Turn back to verse 3 again. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Verse 4. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So the prayer that you need to think about and consider for us missionaries is this. i got to pray that God opens the door for them. i got to pray that as they land in Peru and as they encounter, as they, they bump into, as they meet the Peruvians, that God is going to open a door for them. For what reason? So that they may proclaim the message. So that they may proclaim the gospel. Remember, back in week two, what's the only essential? Christ. And we proclaim Him. We are going there with the, the express purpose of proclaiming the gospel. We're going to proclaim the good news. And He says, help me to do that clearly. Pray that I do that clearly. Now this is Paul, the great preacher, the great missionary. He says, help me to do that clearly. You know, you think, probably in your life, you think, you know what, I, I'm afraid that, that I'm going to drop the ball on this. And I'm not going to be clear. I'm going to, I'm going to mess it up. Paul had the same concern. He said, pray that I do this clearly. That I present the gospel in a way that people understand it. That people can respond to it. And, and pray that for us as our missionaries head off. Proclaim or pray that we proclaim the message clearly. That we don't add to it. That we don't take from it. That we present it clearly as we should. And it will be that message that actually changes lives. That, that impacts people. You know, Romans 1.16 says this, that it is the gospel. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
For it is the gospel that brings salvation. Romans 10 14 says that, that, that how can anyone be saved if they have not heard? It is only through a proclamation of the gospel that salvation can occur. And so we need to present it clearly. We need to proclaim it as clearly as possible so that people can respond. A successful mission must contain a proclamation of the gospel. If we went to Peru and we went around and we handed out bags of rice all day and we built houses and we gave out clothing, if we did all of that and we did not proclaim the gospel, we have not done our job. And we have no possibility of of seeing people respond to the gospel in salvation. The gospel must be proclaimed. And as we consider what are our responsibilities, what are the, the fundamentals that we have to unpack, it is essential that the proclamation of the, of the gospel be a part of that. And if we turn back to verse 5, it says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Be wise in the way we act around outsiders. You know, this goes back to what we talked about last week. Living different than the world. As we interact with lost people, we should look so different than what the world looks. Our behavior, our actions, the way we talk, the way we think, the way we respond should be completely different than the world. And as the world sees that, they see the difference. It it creates a a, a desire to know more, a desire to, to know what it is that's different about you. And so, as you encounter people in your life, people who are living apart from Christ, you should look different. Respond to them different than what the world does. Act wisely. Don't don't make foolish statements. Don't respond in anger, but thoughtfully. Respond to people and, 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 and interact with them in a way that would draw them to God, not to push them away. You know, we we are human beings. And when we encounter things that are difficult or painful, we respond like human beings. But when we respond in, in, a, in a godly way, when our life looks different, that, that attracts people. That draws people to God. And so as we enter into another nation, we need to interact with them in a way that is different than the world. In a way that draws people to Christ. It's the ugly luggage concept of looking different than what the world does. Continuing in verse 5 again. He says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. And that, that's our next point. Is that a successful mission will be, will be accomplished opportunistically. We need to make sure that we take advantage of every situation that God puts before us. You know, for some people, the problem is attempting to create an opportunity. Attempting to kick the door in. For others, and this is me, the tendency is to not take advantage of the opportunity. For fear of hurting somebody's feelings, for fear of being offensive, we don't take the opportunity. So it's not a matter of kicking the door in, it's a matter of looking to make sure the door is open enough. You know, I want more space than that to walk through. And so we miss opportunities that God has put before us. And He says, make the most of every opportunity. Be aware, be on the lookout. When you see a door open to present the love of Jesus to somebody, step through that door. Don't miss that opportunity. You know, we have a softball team here. And 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 we have a game today, actually, at 2 o'clock, I think. And and it's slow pitch softball. And in slow pitch softball, you're you're looking for that just absolutely perfect pitch. And when they throw that one, it's not, you know, doesn't have too much arm. It's right down in the middle of the plate. It's just where you want it. You have an opportunity. I've got I've got this one pitch. I've got to hit it the best that I can because who knows if I'm going to get another one. And so you need to, to jump on it. And hit it as far as you can. And the same is true as, as we have an opportunity to share Christ. 
You don't know when the next pitch is coming. You don't know when you're going to get another opportunity. If there's somebody that you are trying to reach with the gospel, and God opens a door, listen, that might be the last opportunity that that door is open. You need to step into it. You need to be ready in every moment to do that. To, to, to respond to the need in their life to share Christ with them. Because we don't know if there will be another opportunity. We can't create them. But they can only come from God. Opportunities, obviously, implied in that are limited. We have this idea. We have this notion that I can dictate. I can determine. I'm, okay, I'm not going to share the gospel today. I'll do that another day. I don't have time today. Doesn't seem just right today. I'll do that another day. In that thought is this idea that I am the one that creates opportunity. But it's very clear from that scripture that you don't do that. That is only God's responsibility. And when He places an opportunity before us to share the gospel with someone, we better be ready. We better be prepared to step in. To, to, to share when we have that opportunity to do so. Colossians 4, 6 then says this. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. A successful mission will be accomplished with grace. You know, go back to what we talked about just before. What is grace? Grace is undeserved favor. It's me getting what I did not deserve. God's love bestowed upon me, given to me, not for anything I've done to earn it, purely because He loves me. It's the song that we started with. That's grace. And, and Paul says, when you are around the world, when you are around outsiders, we're not talking about Christians now, we're talking about outsiders, always be graceful with them. And I'm talking about demonstrating grace towards them. I believe that the world cannot understand the grace of God because they don't see grace in Christians. We don't demonstrate grace, undeserved favor towards each other. How in the world is the world going to understand grace as it comes from God? God loved you. He, 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 he died for you. Before you ever made any venture, any move towards Him, He made a move towards you. He gave His life. That's, that's grace. And as we deal with outsiders, we need to be gracious, not harsh. We were talking today in, in our Sunday school class. We were talking about how we respond, how we attempt to win people to Christ. And oftentimes we do this. We look at their behavior. We look at the sinful actions they're involved in and we address that. You know what? You need to get out of that. You need to quit doing that. You need to stop saying those words. You need to stop drinking. You need to stop running. I don't know. Whatever it is that the behavior is that we don't like. And we address the behavior. And yet, the behavior only follows the new heart. And so, our responsibility is not to change behavior. It's to present the gospel so that God can change their heart. And in changing their heart, He will change their behavior. We need to demonstrate grace and love to those people that God has given us the opportunity to, to minister to, to share the gospel with. As, as we go to, to Peru, we, we need to demonstrate that we are the most loving people. And I'm not talking about some fake, pseudo-pretend. I'm talking about true compassion that cares about people. It originates with God Himself. And and when we do these six things, when we pray, when we, we are in, in waiting for the perfect opportunity, when we are look, counting on God to give us the opportunity, when it arises, we proclaim the message. We do that with wise living, being ready in any moment, and we do it with grace. We will have been successful in our mission. Now what God does with that, what someone else, how someone else responds to that, that's not our responsibility. But when we do what God has called us to do, our mission will have been successful. Whether we're talking about Peru, whether we're talking about your, your neighbor, 
whether we're talking about your best friend, your wife, your husband, your son, your grandmother, whatever it might be. We need to make sure that we do those things that God has called us to do and we trust God to do those things that only God can do. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank You today for an opportunity, Lord, to, to, to condition, to celebrate, to send off our missionaries. We thank You, God, that You have given us a, a recipe, a formula for success and that, God, we would not approach this cavalierly. We wouldn't head into this without truly considering the seriousness of what we are about to, to do. But Lord, we would trust in You and allow You, God, to accomplish whatever it is You want to accomplish in and through this team. And we thank You for that. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share a passage of Scripture. It comes from Acts chapter 13. And it was... It was as Paul was preparing for his mission trip with Saul, their first trip together. And it says this, And in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Today, that's what we're going to do. They were commissioned for service. They fasted, they prayed, they heard from God. They, they called them forth, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them off. And, and guys, today, we, we aren't sending 27 people on a, a, a youth group trip. We're not, this isn't vacation. This is the most serious important task that you could ever hope to be a part of. And that is carrying the gospel to a foreign land. Carrying the gospel to people who will not hear the gospel unless you proclaim it. And so as we close today, as we begin to sing, I don't want the, the missionaries to ask them all to, to come forward. And, and I want you to, to stand in the front here as, as we sing this closing song and, and I want to give us all the opportunity to pray for them. Um, because that's what they did in the New Testament. They called them forward, they laid their hands on them, they prayed for them, and they sent them out. That's what we're doing today. So, at, at this time, as we begin to sing, if you're one of the, the 27 missionaries, and they're pretty easily identifiable today, I ask you guys to all come forward and stand for the church.
there is a greater work to be done. You know, these guys have committed to that. And my hope is that this entire church is committed to that. That we have a greater work that lies before us yet. I, as we close today, as we read the, the account from the book of Acts, it says that they, they prayed for them and they sent them out. I, I, would, I would like to ask Kevin if he would, he would just, I mean, just step out and be out with Kevin. And what I'd like to ask you all to do is just this, this morning, just, to, just reach your hands out towards these people in front of you as we pray together. As Kevin prays, commissions them for the mission that, that they have. Uh, so if you, just, if you just reach out your hands forward towards, towards the, the, uh, the missionaries as we pray for this morning. Lord, we just we just thank you for this fantastic opportunity for giving us, Lord, to go serve you. Lord, we pray that, that you do open doors, Lord, and that, that as we go out this week, that no matter what the weaknesses we have, Lord, whatever the things that we struggle with, Lord, that, that we know that you're more than enough. Lord, we pray that, uh, that we can go and overcome those, that we don't focus on those, Lord, but we focus on you, and, that we, and we know that you can give us the strength and the power that we need. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity as a church, Lord. We thank you for the support we got, Lord. We thank you for the volunteers we are here, Lord. We just thank you for this great opportunity to go out and serve you. Lord, we know that you will be there in everything that we do. We know that, that uh, Lord, that, that what we have to give is something we didn't deserve. Lord, what we have to share with those people in Peru, Lord, is, is, is something that that all of us in this country need, Lord, that all of us need to have faith and trust in you. And as we go out, give us the confidence, Lord, to, and, and the opportunity and the right words to say that we can make it clear that, that you are the king, that you are the one who can, who has a love for us and who's given the witness to this grace we come to serve. And that as we go about, Lord, this mission is about you and that we serve you. So, Lord, just uh, be with the, all the people that are going this week, Lord. Be with this congregation, Lord, that we pray for them. And, Lord, that we just trust in you. And all these things, Lord, just uh, we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.